Hello and welcome to the Terran Space Academy, where we help prepare you for a bright future in the space industry. Please don't forget to like and subscribe, and we have Academy-themed merchandise available in the online store. We covered Blue Origin in this lesson, and Rocket Lab in this one. Let's review a little of the origin stories behind these very different companies. Blue Origin was founded in 2000 by Jeff Bezos. In that year, Mr. Bezos was the 55th richest person on Earth. Since then, Blue Origin has grown to have 6,000 employees. And at one time, Mr. Bezos became the richest man on Earth, though not any longer. This company has done some remarkable things. The first dedicated tourist rocket to launch from Earth was the Blue Origin New Shepard. This is a small, single-stage booster and capsule combination that barely goes above the Von Karman line. This rocket has flown 23 times with 21 successes carrying 32 passengers so far. The two failures include a partial success on the very first flight, with New Shepard 1 launching normally, but crashing on the first landing attempt for this rocket system. The fact that New Shepard 2.1 stuck the landing on the next flight is a testament to their engineering expertise at that time. The first six flights carried the RSS Jules Verne capsule. Then New Shepard 3 started flying with the RSS HG Wells. This capsule flew seven times on the New Shepard 3 booster. Then New Shepard 4 started flying passengers on the new RSS First Step capsule with the New Shepard 3 flying cargo-only payloads on the old RSS HG Wells. Booster 4 with the first step capsule flew five more missions with passengers, while Booster 3 with the HG Wells capsule flew two more uncrewed flights with experiments. It was during the second flight that a catastrophic engine failure brought down the New Shepard Booster 3, while the HG Wells was able to escape and land safely. The New Shepard uses a single hydrogen-fueled BE-3 combustion tap-off open-cycle rocket engine called the BE-3PM, which produces about 490 kilonewtons of thrust, but can throttle down to 89 kilonewtons. That's 18%, which is ideal for landing the nearly empty booster. In 2011, Blue Origin began working on something bigger. The BE-4 engine was announced in 2014 as a planned competitor to ULA. ULA had been flying the RP-1-fueled, oxygen-rich pre-burner closed-cycle RD-180, and Congress was afraid it couldn't depend on Russia in the future. One of the few truly prescient moves Congress has made in the last century or so. Then, in a stunning announcement, United Launch Alliance announced a deal to use the Blue Engine 4 on their new Vulcan rocket system. The BE-4 would be a methane-fueled liquid oxygen closed-cycle engine using an oxygen-rich pre-burner, powering a single-shaft turbopump. Oxygen-rich pre-burners like the BE-4 produce more power for their size than fuel-rich ones like the Saturn V F1. This engine was supposed to fly in 2019, but it seems that every time they ramp it up to full power, they suffer a power pack failure. The power pack is the turbo pump system that provides propellant to the rocket engine. These turbo pumps are probably the hardest thing about rocket engines. Let's look at why. Pressure fed engines are the simplest. They usually use helium to pressurize the tanks. They can be a simple cold gas thruster with one tank, or maybe a single tank with hydrazine and a catalyst to produce more power, or hydrogen peroxide, since these react with the catalyst to produce hot gases. This is okay for a reaction control system and in some ways optimal because it's very dependable and simple, but it wouldn't get you very far in space as a propulsion system because the specific impulse is just too low. Next, we get two tanks with maybe hydrazine and nitrogen tetroxide in a hypergolic bipropellant rocket engine. This works fine for smaller applications like landing or taking back off from the moon or again for reaction control systems on large vehicles or for abort escape systems like the Dragon Super Draco engine system. But pressurizing a tank requires another tank under even higher pressure. This becomes a problem when the rocket system gets bigger. To contain the necessary pressure, the tank walls would need to be really thick, and they become too heavy to be practical. You can use an electric pump for small rocket engine applications, while still maintaining some pressure in the tanks to help with propellant flow. 
This is what Astra does with their rocket system. And how Rocket Lab fuels the Rutherford engines on the Electron rocket. But this is not practical for large rocket systems. The batteries to power the electric motor would be too heavy, and the motors themselves just can't produce enough power for a really large rocket. For these systems, you need a very powerful pump. And no pump is more powerful for its size than a turbo pump. A turbo pump is a combination of a turbine, which takes hot expanding gas and turns it into a rotary motion, with a shaft from the turbine that is usually connected to a centrifugal pump. These are enormously powerful. The Saturn V F1 had a turbo pump with a mass of just 1,100 kilograms. Yet it could pump 15,000 kilograms of RP-1 and liquid oxygen propellant every second. Rocket Lab, on the other hand, was founded in 2006 in New Zealand by Peter Beck. If anyone tells me that their country is too small to build a rocket system, I will point to New Zealand. Rocket Lab pioneered the use of electric pumps for orbital rockets. These are called electro pumps or e pumps sometimes. NREC is a company that makes these for small rocket systems. NREC has software that can help you design your own pump for your engine. Rocket Lab designed and built the Electron rocket system. And instead of just barely going above the von Karman line with a single stage rocket system, like Blue Origin, Rocket Lab started putting things into orbit. They also designed the Photon spacecraft system. This is kind of a smart third stage with its own propulsion system to circularize and maintain an orbit. It uses small pressure-fed monopropellant or bipropellant hypergolic rocket engines. The monopropellant version is called the Curie, and it produces 120 newtons of thrust with 320 seconds of specific impulse, which is not bad for a monopropellant. Rocket Lab has kept quiet on which monopropellant they use, and they have developed their own non-toxic, viscous liquid monopropellant. Think of a thick liquid like honey, probably extruded mechanically rather than with pressure. There is also a bipropellant version of the Curie, again not really publicly specified by Rocket Lab. They also have a hypercurie engine. This is a much larger hypergolic bipropellant for long-range missions to the Moon or Mars. Rocket Lab launched the NASA Lunar Capstone mission in June of 2022 with this engine. While Rocket Lab has been sending these things to the Moon, Blue Origin has been showing off parts of its new Glenn rocket system. This rocket system would use the BE-4 engine and be partially reusable. Let's talk about reusable for a minute. The first partially reusable rocket system was, of course, the Space Shuttle. But the first commercial one was the SpaceX Falcon 9. This rocket has nine Merlin engines, each of which has a very high thrust to weight ratio. The number of engines on a rocket system and its ability to throttle down has a big impact on its ability to land itself. When a rocket goes up, it must lift a lot of mass, like the Starship, which will lift about 5,000 metric tons. Then it will come back down almost empty, with a mass of maybe 300 metric tons with reserve propellant. That's about 6% of the launch mass. A rocket with a few relatively powerful engines like the Saturn V F1 again, or the Vulcan with its planned two BE-4s, or even the SpaceX Falcon 9, cannot throttle down nearly enough to hover and land. The first two, in fact, could probably not land at all. The new Shepard boosters can do this with the BE-3 PM, but the bigger engines have a gas generator or pre-burner, and these can only throttle down to about 40% of full power, sometimes only 50% instead of the 6% of an expander cycle engine like the RL-10, or 18% with a combustion tap-off rocket engine system like the BE-3. Even a hover slam maneuver would be almost impossible with just a few gas generator engines. To make an effective reusable first stage booster, you need to be able to throttle down very low or have a lot of engines. If you launch with nine engines, then land with one, throttle down to 40%, you end up with just over 4% of your total launch thrust. This sounds really good until you realize your rocket only has 6% of the mass it did on takeoff. The new Glenn plans to use seven of the BE-4 engines. Since these can only throttle down to about 40 to 50%, we get a landing thrust of about 5.7% of launch thrust. This would require a hover slam maneuver like a Falcon 9. The new Glenn will use an expendable second stage 
powered by its own modified BE-3 engines called the BE-3U. This rocket, if it flies, will be able to get 45 metric tons to low Earth orbit. This will beat the SpaceX Falcon 9, which also has an expendable second stage, but can only get a little less than 17 metric tons to low Earth orbit. The Falcon 9 is flying, however. The Vulcan using a Centaur second stage powered by RL-10 engines, and the new Glenn are not. Let's look at why that might be. And to do that, we need to look at the Neutron rocket system. The Neutron was described in this lesson, and it is planned to have a unique deployment system. SpaceX uses parachutes to bring their fairings back down into the ocean, and ships to recover them. New Glenn fairings won't be recovered at all, as far as I can see but it occurred to the innovative engineers at Rocket Lab that they could do better. The Neutron rocket is now planned to have two fairings to open instead of four. The second stage, therefore, would not need to be aerodynamic, saving mass, and could be released to fly on into space while the first stage would close its nose cone and come back to land. This system is more reusable than the Falcon 9 or New Glenn, but less than the Starship or Terran R, which has fully reusable second stages. The Neutron was originally planned to have seven engines, like the new Glenn, but this has changed. It will now have nine engines, probably to make a controlled landing easier. The Neutron will be using the Archimedes rocket engine. Archimedes is a methane and liquid oxygen powered rocket engine. It was first designed to use an open cycle gas generator. The Archimedes engine is designed to produce 730 kilonewtons, which is much less than the BE-4, which is designed to produce 2,400 kilonewtons or the SpaceX Raptor 2, which can already produce 2,300 kilonewtons. But the Neutron rocket is much smaller than the Starship. It will have a total mass of around 480 metric tons, making it closer to the Falcon 9 of 550 metric tons, and the Vulcan at around 547 metric tons, than the Starship at 5,000 metric tons. The Vulcan, with its efficient RL-10-powered hydrogen-fueled Centaur second stage, will be able to get 27.2 metric tons to low Earth orbit. More than the Falcon 9 or the Neutron, the Vulcan, however, will be fully expendable. In expendable mode, the Falcon 9 can get about 22.8 metric tons to low Earth orbit, and about 16.7 if it lands downrange. The Neutron will be able to get 15 metric tons to low Earth orbit expendable. 13 metric tons if it lands downrange on a barge, and 8 metric tons if it returns to the launch site. This is almost exactly half what the Falcon 9 can do. But not every satellite is the mass of a school bus, and dedicated launch vehicles are in demand. The Neutron is betting on being dependable, reusable, and affordable. Rocket Lab's goal is not to push the envelope on power like the BE-4, and combustion chamber pressure like the Raptor, but to design the Archimedes rocket engine so everything will run in a comfortable range. Not putting too much stress on any one component, but after an analysis of the planned open gas generator cycle for the Archimedes, Rocket Lab has changed their minds. They are now going to make the Archimedes a closed cycle, single oxygen rich preburner staged combustion engine, almost exactly like the BE-4. How can they hope to succeed at this when Blue Origin, with all of its resources, has failed for one thing, I believe that Rocket Lab is one of the most innovative space companies on the planet, perhaps even someday surpassing SpaceX. Rocket Lab started with the Electron rocket system, getting up to 300 kilograms to low Earth orbit. They now want to get into the extra heavy satellite market, which is anything over 7,000 kilograms. Secondly, the Archimedes is much smaller than the BE-4. Here you see the BE-4 from Blue Origin's website next to a human being. The average human is about 1.75 meters tall, which is 5 foot 9 inches. That would make the BE-4 about 4.4 meters or about 14 and a half feet tall. This is bigger than the Raptor, which is about 3.1 meters or 10 feet tall. Here you can see the Archimedes rocket engine, next to Rocket Lab CEO Peter Beck, who looks to me to be an average height man. If Beck is about 1.75 meters tall, that would put this rocket engine at about 2.4 meters by my estimation. This is much smaller than the BE-4, and a little more than three-fourths the height of the Raptor. Again, the Archimedes will be down-tuned somewhat, 
so it does not work too hard to produce its 730 kilonewtons of thrust. It can throttle down to 50%, about the same as the BE-4, and should have a sea level specific impulse of 329 seconds in this configuration, about the same as a Raptor, and a vacuum specific impulse of 367 seconds, a little less than what's estimated for the vacuum Raptor version. The engine is planned to be built in Virginia and will be tested at the Stennis test stand in Mississippi. Pre-burner testing will begin next year, with full engine testing planned before the end of 2023, and a possible launch in 2024. Blue Origin delivered an engine to ULA for fit testing in July of 2020. This was a Pathfinder engine still under development, not a qualified flight engine. In July of 2022, Blue Origin shipped its first flight version to Texas for testing. This engine was installed on the test stand in August 2022, but as soon as they began to hotfire the engine, a problem was discovered, and the engine had to be immediately sent back to Kent, Washington for repairs. Another engine was being readied for testing, but this delay made a 2022 flight almost impossible. The slow pace of production of these engines is dramatically hampering their ability to be delivered on time. United Launch Alliance has contracts to launch Vulcan twice immediately with several military contracts pending successful flights. The Vulcan needs two engines per flight. Blue Origin also wants to launch their new Glenn rocket and has four launches planned for 2023. They will need to have 32 engines ready in 2023 to meet their obligations. When it comes to competition for SpaceX, which has produced over 100 Raptor engines, swapping them out whenever there is an issue, people should stop looking at Blue Origin and start looking at innovative companies with a dedicated leader, like Rocket Lab. Here we see the Archimedes engine. Let's see what we can identify. We have seen turbo pump designs explained before, but most turbo pumps are fuel rich, like this one. The BE-4 and Archimedes will both use an auction rich pre-burner single shaft turbo pump. The first of these was the design still flying on the Russian RD-180. Here we see an artist's rendering of what one looks like and we'll freeze it here. Oxygen rich pre-burner and turbine, a little bit of fuel will be brought up to burn in the pre-burner. The very hot expanding oxygen rich gas will power the turbine. Then go into the engine injector head to the combustion chamber. Then we have bearings and seals to keep the hot oxygen rich gas away from the fuel. Next we see a fuel intake port. In here there will be an inducer to get the cold liquid fuel moving and reduce cavitation then an impeller to pump the fuel at high pressure around the engine for cooling. After cooling the engine and nozzle, the fuel will be collected. Then the now heated and expanded fuel, especially for methane, but not that much for RP-1, is pumped into the combustion chamber to burn with the hot oxygen rich gas. My question to you is, on the Archimedes engine, we see fuel coming in here and then being pumped around the nozzle with our pre-burner feed line coming off here. Does the cooling shroud cover the entire nozzle and combustion chamber, coming all the way up here to go into the injector head? Let me know what you think. I wish we could see the back of this engine, but maybe next time they'll have it turned the other way. Why do I think Rocket Lab is so much more capable than Blue Origin? Listen sometime to Elon Musk explaining the Raptor engine, to Tim Dodd, the everyday astronaut, or to Jay Leno just the other day. Have you ever heard Jeff Bezos waxing poetic about turbines and pre-burners and ignition systems? The one making the decisions must understand the concepts and technology well enough to know when to change his mind and try something different. We said in our BE-4 failure analysis that we thought the massive single oxygen rich turbo pump on the BE-4 was its weak point, that the stress on the blades at full power was too extreme. Let's listen to Peter Beck the CEO of Rocket Lab, explained the decisions he's made along the way as he designs the Neutron rocket to compete with the Falcon 9. And you will understand why I think SpaceX's true competition in the commercial satellite launch market is not Blue Origin and definitely not the United Launch Alliance, but a company started in New Zealand. I'd like to kind of, you know, drive this home that um, all of you, all, everything you've seen today is, is about positioning us um, to be actually be able to deliver on an application in the future. 
Um, we're not talking about applications that, that we might or, or, or may or may not uh, get involved with in the future, but I think it's pretty clear that you can see we're building the infrastructure and in many cases have built the infrastructure to really enable us to go and do anything we want, either in low Earth orbit, medium Earth orbit, geo or interplanetary. Um, we, we have all the capability there um, and we, we continue to build on that. Okay, so um, uh, now for kind of the, the, the meat of this is uh, to, to talk about Neutron and, and give everybody a bit of a, uh, a Neutron update. And I guess the, the message here is like, this is happening. This is not, uh, this is not a PowerPoint hope um, or, or anything. This is, this is happening. We, we, are, we are building this thing. There's real hardware coming and, uh, and it's, it's, it's an exciting time. Uh, this is a turkey. Um, the reason why this is a turkey is um, building a rocket is kind of like cooking a turkey. And I was trying to think of something to, to explain a very, very complicated thing, but actually it's quite simple. So when you start off with a turkey, you get this bird, it's, it's not very attractive, it's kind of gross, and you've got to stuff it and massage it and put a whole lot of effort into it, and it really doesn't look great. Um, you, you burn a whole lot of work, but it's not until you actually pull it out of the oven and you put it on the table that everyone goes, oh, wow, that's amazing. And you, you, you get that gratification of all of your effort. So where we are with, with, with Neutron right now is we're flat out stuffing that turkey as, as, as hard and fast as we can. Um, and uh, you'll see a lot of the things we're talking about are super, super kind of infrastructure heavy, uh, foundational things that enable you to, to, you know, to, to do you know, the things you need to do and actually develop, um, you know, develop the program. So it's coming to life. Um, now, one of the things with, uh, with Electron is it's a composite vehicle, carbon composite vehicle. And this black kind of you know, thing that looks like a, a bit of a piece of staging, that's not staging, that's a piece of tank. So that's half, half of a first stage section of a tank to give you guys a sense of scale of the diameter of this thing. I mean, it's, it's, it's big. Um, and you know, that's made out of the carbon composite materials um, that, that we'll intend to, uh, to fly with. So with a carbon, with a carbon composite vehicle, one of, the, one of the, the best ways to kind of determine or defer, understand progress is like, are you building molds or not? Because if you're building molds, uh, that, that means that the design is mature enough that you're actually, you're actually investing in the tooling. Because building a composite rocket's a little bit different to building a metallic rocket. Building a metallic rocket, you basically need no tooling. You can, you can get started and you can start banging bits of metal together and, and, and iterating and iterating and, and, and following that path. Composite rocket, it's like you build the tools. Once, your tools, once you've got the tools, then you're banging them out. So um, for us to, uh, to be at this point where we're building tools should give everybody a, a pretty high degree of confidence that uh, we, where we are in, in the program. Um, so uh, lots of tools. Um, and lots of parts coming off tools, uh, and you know it, it's uh, it, it's really the, the toughest bit is building uh, is kind of getting through the design phase to the to the confidence level that you can build tools, go build tools, and start uh, start banging out parts, and um, and and that's that that's where we are today on on that. So the first neutron tanks here uh, you'll see come to life by the end of the year, which is uh, it, it's super important, and it's actually a really you know quite big milestone. Um, and I guess the other, the other point here is like, um, we're building it. There's, there's real hardware coming off real machines. Um, and I think one of the things that, um, that it's, it's kind of like turkey stuffing is um, like, you, we had to order the machines a year ago or more. Um, machine, these kind of machines that we're, we're, we're building this on aren't your, you know, go to Lowe's and pick it up. These are bespoke machines, some of which there's only one or two of them in the world. Um, very, very large 3D printers, uh, very, uh, you know, incredibly, uh, you know, as you see in that image there, a very unique 3D printer that 3D prints and machines at the same time. Uh, and, we, you know, Rocket Lab has its history in, in ad additive manufacturing. Uh, we, we were the first company to ever ad additively manufacture or 3D print a rocket engine and put it into orbit. We've put over 300 engines into space now. So we really know this technology well, um, and, you know, we're really starting to, uh, to, to see parts. And... Um, you know, like I say, a lot of, lot of turkey stuffing to get to this point because uh, defining the machines, some machines don't even exist. Uh, these are machines that have never been built uh, and seeing all those machines coming online now is, is, uh, is super exciting.
Um, and a little bit of a recap with the, the vehicle. You know, th this wasn't a vehicle that we all we all kind of sat around a boardroom table and designed by committee. This was a vehicle that was kind of just yelled at us, yelled at us by our customers. Um, and so that you know, its, it's configurability, its, its payload performance, all of that is, is being market driven. So uh, I want to exp expel a little bit of a, a theory here. Um, so the vehicle is capable of lifting 15 tons to orbit, expendable. Um, and there are some expendable missions, there'll be some end of life missions that we'll, we will do that uh, if a customer requires. It lifts 13 tons reusable if we land down range. Uh, it lifts eight tons if we return it to the pad. Um, now obviously we love returning it to the pad because um, that, that will be uh, you know, the, lowest, the lowest cost. Uh, it's the least amount of infrastructure, um, but equally well we can, uh, you know, we have requirements to land it down range. So call it a 15 ton launch vehicle. I know that uh, we probably um, weren't, weren't as clear as we could have been about when we call it an eight ton launch vehicle, it means it's eight ton returning to the pad, but it's, it's kind of a 15 ton Falcon 9 class uh, vehicle. 42 metres high, um, the fairing diameter is 5 metres. Um, the first stage is, is a bit over 7 metres in diameter, so a really, really big um, first stage. Um, one thing that's changed is we've added a few more engines on the bottom, um, and we've changed the engine geometry a little bit, and, and uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about, um, about that in a minute. Um, Neutron's kind of uh, famous or infamous for its, its hungry hippo fairing. So it's, it's a slightly less hungry hippo now, so it's two hip fairing halves instead of four. Um, and we made that change uh, to just reduce pass ca part count and, and complexity, um, but that, that's one of the small changes um, of the vehicle is, is now we have uh, a true hungry hippo um, fairing rather than a, than a four-way um, hung, hungry, hungry hippo um, fairing. So um, the, the, the kind of the first stage major design elements um, are complete, and um, Neutron is kind of a, a weird-looking launch vehicle um, because it's designed to go up just as much, just as well as it's designed to go down. And if you've ever played um, bad, badminton, I find it an intensely frustrating game. But if you've ever played it, like you hit that shuttlecock super hard, and it goes fast for just like an annoyingly short period of time before it rapidly decelerates. And um, that's because it's got a low mass and a high ballistic coefficient. And the, the real challenge with a reusable launch vehicle is actually it's a thermal problem. It's a heating pro problem on re-entry. It's not a control problem, it's, it's not a performance problem, it's a thermal problem. And the very best way to deal with a thermal problem is just to not have one. So um, the reason why the vehicle is carbon composite, super light, very, very large diameter at the base is because we have, once just like a shuttlecock, we have a very low mass and a high ballistic coefficient. So it decelerates really quickly and doesn't produce a whole bunch of heat. Now there's a couple of subtle details. If you notice, the shape of it's a little bit larvary lamp kind of shaped. It's not, it's not for any shape for that, any other reason other than uh, it basically we have a decreasing pressure um, profile across the vehicle so we don't attach any shock waves um, and, and it, it just keeps it cool. Let's just say it, it keeps all the thermal loads um, kind, of, kind of under control. Uh, this is not a capsule announcement announcement, so we're not announcing a capsule just to be clear, but we get lots and lots of people asking us about, um, about you know, human rating. Um, and uh, so the vehicle is designed to be human rateable. Um, you don't design a vehicle like this with, without that in mind. Um, you know, we, we, don't, uh, we don't have any particular um, programs focusing on capsules, uh, but, but we're looking at it. Um, clearly, you're not going to make a vehicle without um, having that in mind. Um, so just be clear, this is not a capsule announcement, announcement um, but if we were going to do something, that was what it would look like, um, in theory. And then uh, the second stage uh, is, is obviously, um, the second stage is, is, a, is a real pain because it has competing requirements. Uh, it needs to be the cheapest, but it also needs to be the highest performing. So generally those two things don't go together, um, but one of the, the beauties with, um, with, with our construction is that uh, it's very fast to produce uh, very high performance lightweight structures, so you get the performance and, and, uh, and, and you know, really low cost. Um, the geometry and the way that we've kind of integrating this payload makes it super easy for customers to get in there and integrate and get out um, and, uh, and, and really optimize that whole flow. I mean, we've done this 30 odd times on, on Electron. We know what it takes to integrate a payload. We know all the pain points. Um, we know how we can streamline that to save the customer time and cost and, and ourselves time and, and cost as well. So we've really taken all of those lessons um, that we've learned and, and piled them in, um, in into Neutron here. 
So um, I think composites often get a bad rap that's like, oh, they're expensive, they're slow to build, and, uh, and like, no. If, if you think those things, you just don't know how to make composite structures. And composite structures have been, uh, you know, made in an automated fashion in the aerospace industry forever. I mean, right, right back to 737 tail fins. Like, um, the process we're using here is called automated tape laying, um, and, and literally it's, I don't want to say the word 3D printing, but it's kind of like 3D printing a rocket, but it's not 3D printing. It's, it's, you're literally laying down meters of carbon fiber a minute. So the time to go and build one of these structures is just super, super short. And as a result, um, it's, it's incredibly cost effective. So um, we're kind of uh, taking this technology out of the aviation industry and, and applying it into the space industry here. So a lot of people in the space industry think this is new. You talk to someone in the aviation industry, it's just like, oh yeah, we've done this for years. Um, but we're just applying it to these, these kinds of structures. Um, so what you end up with is, is super lightweight, super high performance uh, structures um, that, are, that are really inexpensive. And you know, carbon composite on a strength to mass ratio is, is at least four times lighter than metallics or steels. So you use a quarter of the amount of the material for the same specific strength. So um, you don't actually, yep, the raw material is expensive, but the, the, the trick here is you don't actually use that much. Um, so even though the raw material, you know, for a kg is more expensive, there's just, there's just not that much in it. Okay, so probably one of the bigger updates is, uh, is the Archimedes engine, um, and we'll start to see uh, some pre-burner fire here by the end of the year. Um, Sean DeMello is going to talk a little bit uh, more, more about that. Um, now, uh, I guess that there's, a, there's a model of it behind me here. You can see that it's a fairly significant engine. Um, it really leverages all of our additive manufacturing uh, technologies and, and experience over, over the year. For the, for the kind of rocket geeks in the crowd, you'll look at the ISPs and go, uh, it's only 330 seconds of ISP or you know, 367 vac for a liquid oxygen methane engine. Those ISPs aren't, aren't, they're just average. But we're trying to build like the most reliable, the most reusable engine possible. So um, really, we, we, don't, we have such lightweight and high performance structures that we don't need to extract every second of ISP out of the engine. And why that's important is that these engines are not stressed. And if you're sitting in an aircraft and you look out on the wing and you look at that turbine engine, you don't want to look out at a turbine engine that's literally running within 1% of its capability of its life. Like, that doesn't make me feel good. Uh, you want to look out on a wing of a turbine, of, a, of, a, of an aircraft, and look at a turbine that's got heaps of margin and heaps of safety factor. Like, that, that thing can just run and run, it can suck a bird and just keep on running and running. That's, that's what you want for a reusable rocket. Um, and that's what we're building here um, with, with, uh, with Archimedes. So we, we kind, of, kind of go to pains to saying we're building the most boring rocket engine possible. Um, but that's what's required um, for, for, to be successful for this vehicle. So one kind of uh, big update, and um, for all, once again, the, uh, the, the rocket geeks in the crowd, they'll look over at that and go, well, that's not a gas generator cycle. What's going on here? So we did change the, the, uh, the cycle from being a, a gas generator cycle into an oxidizer-rich closed cycle. Now, the rationale behind that is that as we started working through, um, working through all of the, the, the concept of operations and um, did all the power balances of the engine and really got down into the weeds, what we found is that, um, that we started to get you know, turbine temperatures that were looking too high. We started having to make a whole bunch of compromises because you know, we, need, we need this vehicle to be able to deliver a mission to like Mars. That means you need really high performance in the upper stage, which means it's probably a very low mass. And you just butt up against these throttling curves all the time. And of course, when you're landing, you also need uh, good, good throttling. Except in the upper stage, you need good throttling and good ISP. So we just found that um, we were continually falling off the curve on the GG cycle. If you had one fixed engine uh, throttle point, great. But we don't. We have a whole bunch of engine throttle points. Uh, and we just we found ourselves, we're pushed right up against a wall. And it, it really defeated the purpose of trying to build the most boring engine when our turbine temperatures were getting too high, the power balance was, was getting a bit ugly, and we just didn't have any margin. Now, oxidizer-rich uh, oxidizer you know, closed cycles are typically the cycle you use when you want the most amount of performance. That is, that is the go-to for, like, I want every second of ISP. And the reason why I pointed out the ISP at the very beginning is because 
if you just dial back the ISP and say, no, 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 we don't need 10,000 PSI chamber pressure, we only need 1,500, 2,000 PSI chamber pressure, we don't need this crazy ISP, then what you end up with is just a super, super brick engine. Like this, this thing, the turbine temperatures in this engine are super, super low. The power balance is just sitting right in the middle. So that, what that really means is we have a heap of scope to throttle up or throttle down or increase the performance um, if, if, we ever, if, if we ever need to. So it's kind of, it's kind of like, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's the most boring oxidizer rich closed cycle engine uh, with the lowest temperatures you ever see and the lowest chamber pressures. But that's exactly what you want uh, for a reusable vehicle that just needs to go over and over and over um, again. So uh, that, that's probably the, um, you know, the, the biggest change here. And uh, there's some pump parts uh, over on the tables there. When we go over there for a drink, um, pick up the pump parts and have a look. There's actually an a, a oxidizer volute from an electron there and one from neutron to give you a sense of scale um, and the, the difference. So um, by all means, uh, have a look and, and uh, poke around the engine there as well. Now you see why I think that Rocket Lab will succeed where Blue Origin has failed. Let me know if you agree. And thank you for your help on Patreon. We appreciate you. At Astra Proterra.